Hey everyone. In this video, I'll guide you through the video planning process. I'll take you through a template that I created that you can fill out step by step and will make the video planning process much faster and more efficient. I think you'll find that a little bit of extra time spent during the planning stages will save you a lot of time during video production. Okay, let's get to work. Okay, so I've created a file here in my computer called educational videos. And within that file, I have a document called video production template. This is a document I created to make the creation of your videos a lot easier. All you have to do to plan your video is to fill in this template. So let's open it up. And this is what it looks like. It's just a Word document with a table and several sections. I'll go through them briefly. First is the topic that your video will be on. Second is the learning objectives or what you want your students to learn. Next is the source material, for example, textbooks, readings, videos, anything that provides information that you'll use to produce your video. Next, we have common misconceptions or content that you may want to choose to spend more time on or emphasize. After that is content that you may choose to skip or emphasize less. After that is the video title. After that is the assessments that you'll use to determine how well your students understand what you're teaching them in the video, but more importantly, uh, assessments to give your students practice using the concepts that you're teaching them. After that is prior knowledge needed to answer all questions. Uh, in addition to the video content, this is basically everything that your students need to know to be able to answer all the assessments correctly, but is not included in your video. And we'll get to this point in this video. Uh, and then after that is a section on the video script and learning guide questions, as well as an attributions table for organizing any media that you use. Um, where you'll find that media and the attribution or license that that media is licensed under. So in this video, I'll go over um, all the sections, uh, including and above prior knowledge. So we'll go over everything from topic to prior knowledge all the way down here. And filling in these sections and planning the video is exactly the same for all three types of videos for the pencil and paper video, the basic screencast and the advanced screencast. So no matter what type of video you're planning on making, you'll be filling in these sections of this template. And having a template I find um, really helps me keep all my information organized and also helps me stay on task. Um, the time it takes me to plan a video is a lot less now that I work off of a template and I hope it saves you time as well. Now, the first thing you want to do, uh, perhaps even before filling out this template, definitely before filling out this template and planning your video is create a folder for the video that you are going to make. So within the educational videos folder, I'm going to create a new folder and call that double fertilization video. Okay. And since I don't want to change this template, I want to save it as a new document because I'm going to fill it in. I'm going to go to file, save as, and I'm going to title this new document that I'm going to fill in the template for. Uh, I'll call it uh, master document double fertilization. Okay. And uh, you can call it whatever you want, but it's basically the filled in template, right? It's the master document that will uh, have all the necessary information for you to start producing your video. So I'll save that. And I'll go to my finder window. And here's my new folder, or here's my new document, right? Um, and I'm actually going to put this master document into the folder titled double fertilization, right? So all of my documents that have to do, and all of my files that have to do with creating this double fertilization video will be housed within this folder. 
Okay, so um, what we'll do for the rest of this video is I will show you what goes in each of these sections and how to fill them out. And as an example, I will actually fill in each of these sections for my video on double fertilization. And below this video, I'll leave a link both for this uh, template document and for a completely filled in master document for double fertilization, just so you can see what uh, a master document looks like when it's completed. So first the topic, pretty simple. My topic is double fertilization. And the video that, um, that I'm basing this off of that I actually already made um, is on double fertilization and seed development, but I'm only going to fill in this document for the double fertilization part of that video just in the interest of time. So my topic is double fertilization. Oh, and I'll leave a link for that video if you haven't seen it yet below this video as well. Okay, next is learning objectives, and this is just what you want your students to learn. Places for five learning objectives here, you can have more or less, up to you. But below each learning objective, I have also put something called to meet learning objective one in this case, students will. So in this spot next to learning objective one, you're going to type what your first learning objective is. And here, where it says students will, you'll write down everything students will actually do to complete that learning objective or to learn that thing. And this learning objective section is probably the most important part of planning your video or just a course in general, because everything else in this planning document is going to derive from these learning objectives. So let me give you an example. What I'm going to do is simply just copy and paste my learning objectives that I have for my double fertilization topic and paste them into this document. There we are. Okay, and I have five of them. For example, the first one is remember the names, ploides, and functions of the cells involved in double fertilization, both before and after fertilization occurs. And in order to learn that, I will have students view the video, answer learning guide questions afterwards, do a few online formative assessment questions. These are low stakes questions where students can actually correct their mistakes if they get it wrong. Then the students will do some in-class think, pair, share questions, and I'll give them some practice exam questions as well. Oh, and I didn't list it here, but students will have to do a bit of reading on double fertilization too. So that's a lot of different things that I'm having students do to learn double fertilization. And not only that, but they are doing these things at different times throughout the course. So this is taking advantage of two principles of learning, space practice and varied practice. Varied practice is when if someone wants to learn something, it helps that person learn it faster if they practice that thing in different ways. Here, students are practicing learning about double fertilization by viewing a video and answering several questions in different contexts and in different ways. Some they're doing on their own, some they're doing in a collaborative way. And they're also doing some reading on the subject. So that's uh, several different ways that students are learning and practicing the subject. Space practice is when students practice something, but rather than practice it over and over and over on one or a few occasions, they practice that thing on different occasions, leaving some time between instances when they're practicing it. And so I take advantage of this a lot in my course. After students view the video, they'll immediately answer some learning guide questions just to make sure that they remember what they saw, but then some time will pass and they'll do some online formative questions and then some more time will pass. And then they'll do some in-class think pair share questions. And when it comes time to study for the exam, they'll do some practice exam questions on this same topic. So students will be practicing learning about double fertilization at several different times throughout the course. And research shows that that's better for learning. So varied practice and space practice, very, very helpful. If you wanna learn more about these things, you can check out the book, Make It Stick, which I think every teacher should, uh, should read, some useful stuff in there. Now, your video does not have to 
address all the learning objectives that you need your students to learn about on the topic of, for example, double fertilization. My video only addresses these first three learning objectives. But I have two more learning objectives that I chose to address in class instead. And that's because I like to teach uh, skills more in class and have my students learn knowledge outside of class. Because skills, for example, applying knowledge uh, to make inferences about a subject and applying knowledge to interpret and summarize primary literature, uh, those are more difficult skills to master. And I want students to be able to help each other and to have my help in class in, in doing that. So that's why I plan my course that way. Um, but that all is to say that you don't have to complete all of your learning objectives with your videos. You can complete those learning objectives however you want, through having your students write essays or make speeches or you know create an art project, whatever your learning objectives are, uh, you can you know, be pretty flexible with how they learn it. Videos are just one way to do that. You'll probably also have the situation where uh, multiple videos or multiple, um, you know, things in your class will, will uh, address more than one learning objective, or maybe some of the questions that you write for the assessment section will address more than one learning objective. And that's completely normal, so you can expect that to happen. Okay, so next we have our source material, and it's a good idea to list all the source material that you're going to use for this video. Um, this includes both material in a paper format, like a textbook or something, as well as online material that you may use as source material for your video. Um, this is basically everything that contains the knowledge that you need to present in your video. And this can take the form of readings in the form of a textbook or maybe a novel that you want your students to read. It can come in the form of figures. It can even come in the form of other videos. And this is a good point to make sure that you don't reinvent the wheel. If there is a video out there that meets your needs and addresses all the content that you want to present to your students at an appropriate level, then use that video instead of making your own as long as the video has a license that allows you to actually use it to teach your students. You can also, of course, get content from websites or anywhere else you can imagine. But this is the section that I recommend um, that you, you know, just at least make a note of where all your information is coming from that you want to present to your students. And I'll just give you an example of the source material for my double fertilization video. Here's one video I found on double fertilization. There's just a link to that. I also have a reading. And since this is for an open source course, uh, I'm not using any readings from textbooks or anything like that. This is just from an open source online textbook. And I didn't have any figures that I wanted to present, so I made a note of that as well. Under figures, I just wrote uh, none draw everything. And I'll talk about the decision to either present um, a figure or have the students draw it when you draw it later. Um, there are some pros and cons to that. I tend to side on, I tend to err on the side of having students draw something when I draw it because the way I think about it, if it's not important enough to ask students to write it down or, or draw it or sketch it out in some way, is it really important enough for me to teach them? So I tend to have my students draw a lot, but of course this depends on the nature of the content of your course. Now, you don't necessarily have to have your students look at all these sources of information. Um, you can, perhaps, you know, a source of information for your video is the textbook that you're using and the students happen to read that as well, but they don't necessarily have to read all of this. This is just a comprehensive listing of all the information that, or all the sources for the information that you want to present in your video. There's another video that I found on Khan Academy that I'll put in here as well. Let's just copy and paste that into here under videos as well. But when I viewed this video, um, I decided that it had a lot of extraneous information that I didn't want my students to necessarily learn in the context of my class. Uh, some of it was just beyond the scope of uh, a genetics class. 
And there was also a little bit of inaccurate information on the webpage below that video. And honestly, I just felt that I could make a better video, although I love Khan Academy and I encourage you all to, to check it out for some excellent videos that you can use for your students. Um, I actually learned how mortgages work looking at Khan Academy videos way back when. Um, so that's a good place to go to make sure that you're not you know, reinventing the wheel. But in this case, I felt I could do a better job than they did um, in the context of an upper level genetics class. Most of their content is for lower level students. Next, we have the section on common misconceptions and content to emphasize. And the more experienced you are, the better idea you'll have of the areas of content that your students have trouble with. Also, not all topics are created equal. Some deserve more attention of you and your students than others. I tend to emphasize concepts that are repeatedly needed for future parts of the course or future courses and are just more interesting to both me and my students. I also tend to emphasize topics that I think are more important for their careers or just for their life in general. So for example, in my non-majors class, I spend a lot of time talking about vaccines. One way you can, if you're a new teacher, figure out the things that your students have the most trouble with is just by looking at their work and seeing what they get wrong the most. You can also just ask them, by using a tactic called a muddy point or a muddy concept, which basically involves at the end of class or the beginning, just asking them what they had the most trouble understanding that day or the day before. The next section is on what to emphasize less. And again, you're the best judge of this here, but I tend to skip or de-emphasize things that are not used later on in the course or are just, you know, kind of less interesting. I tend to spend more time on these two topics, fusion of nuclei and the movement of the sperm cells and the sperm nuclei during double fertilization. Uh, these are just areas of uh, some difficulty for my students. So I spend more time on them. And for double fertilization, I decided to skip uh, fruit formation. I decided it was just a little bit outside of the scope of my upper level genetics class. So. I decided not to spend any time on it. So that's the content that I decided to uh, emphasize and skip. Next we have the video title. And don't overthink this. The video title should just be what the video is about. It should make it easy for your students to find it when they're going back and studying for an exam, for example. So avoid naming your videos things like video one, video two, uh, module 5, video 2, something like that. So I'm just going to name my video very simply double, I can't spell double, double fertilization. Next we'll take a look at assessments. Here's the assessments section. And you can break up your assessments any way you want. Um, I've broken it up by assignment type. So I'll have questions for uh, my exams questions for practice exams, questions for online formative assessments, and questions that I'll have students do in class. Now, of course, your assessments don't have to be questions that students answer. They can be anything. They can be a project, an essay, a story, a work of art, whatever you want your students to do. Now, your assessments will derive directly from your learning objectives. So let's go back up to our learning objectives. I have five. And typically what I'll do is take a look at each learning objective and write several questions or whatever kind of assessments I'm using for that learning objective. I'll then sort them into the different types of questions that I want to use them for. So I'll write a bunch of questions. I'll decide to use some of them as exam questions, some as formative assessment questions, some as in-class questions, so on and so forth. That's just how I do it. You can do it however you like. Now I'll show you the questions that I wrote for my uh, double fertilization video. And there are quite a lot of them, so I'll highlight what I already have and replace that. Okay, so these are all my questions. Um, I typically write my questions and then bold the answers. That just makes it easier for me to find the correct answer when I'm grading. Okay, so let's go to the top here. Now, after writing your question, 
it's a really good idea to write the learning objective that that question addresses. So for example, this question that I've written here is a multi-part question, it's an in-class question, and this question happens to address learning objective five. So I've done that for all of these questions. I've written down the learning objective, and sometimes the questions address more than one learning objective. I've written down the learning objective that each question addresses, and I write them right above each question. And this allows me to make sure that each of my learning objectives is being addressed in my assessments. And when I go through all of my questions, I make sure that each learning objective has at least uh, a few uh, questions that goes along with it. So this one, learning objective five, this one addresses learning objective two, so on and so forth. Now that doesn't mean that each learning objective has to have the same number of assessments. Not all content is equally important, and so you may choose to focus uh, more of your questions or assessments on one learning objective as compared to another. That's completely up to you. You're the best judge of that. And once again, I'll emphasize here that not all learning objectives have to be addressed in your video. For example, my learning objectives four and five were addressed in class. They were not addressed in the video per se. Another thing you may want to consider when writing your assessments is Bloom's taxonomy. Now, I'm not going to go through this in detail here. It's basically just different levels of learning and different things that your students can be able to do with the knowledge that you're giving them. Now, just for example, if you want your students to be able to analyze data, then just make sure that you're giving them enough practice via your content and assessments at analyzing data. These verbs are also useful in writing your learning objectives as well. Now, I often find that um, students struggle to achieve the higher order uh, levels of, of learning, in other words, the, uh, the tasks on the top of Bloom's Pyramid, because they don't have a strong understanding in other words, if students can't remember something or don't understand something, they're not going to be able to apply it or analyze it in any kind of meaningful context. Therefore, when I design my courses, in particular my videos, I make sure to give students lots of remember and understanding questions right after they view my video. So for example, my learning guide questions and the online questions I have my students do right after viewing my video are really at the remembering level and understanding level. And then I do these higher order things, generally in class where students have more support. So that's just one way to approach this pyramid. There are many others. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time describing this, so check it out on your own if you're not familiar with it. Now, the last part of planning your video I'll talk about here is prior knowledge needed to answer all questions. So here is where you'd want to write everything the students would need to know to answer your assessments correctly that is not included in your video. So for example, um, I made a video on Mendelian genetics and I taught my students how to predict the results of a cross between two parents. And I explained to them how to do that, but a lot of my students were still getting questions associated with that video wrong. And I later found out it's because they were having trouble adding and multiplying fractions. So that's an example of prior knowledge that was needed to answer the questions I was asking them, but wasn't included in what I was actually teaching them. So, you know, as a solution to that, I actually had them go view a couple of videos on fractions on Khan Academy because I'm not a math teacher. I found I wasn't very good at teaching it. So this is the point where you want to list all of that. And it can be kind of hard to determine what your students need to know that you're not including in your video because you already know those things. It can be hard to put yourself in your students' shoes. And it can be easy to take for granted that students actually remember what we previously taught them or what they learned in a previous course. 
In my experience, that's a pretty bad assumption. Uh, students remember relatively little from what they learned in past courses or in past chapters of the same course even. Doing this kind of thing can also help you understand why students get some of your questions wrong, like I explained with Mendelian genetics and fractions. So I'll give you some examples from my double fertilization video of some prior knowledge that students need to be able to understand the video and the associated assessments, but that I didn't necessarily include in that video. And you don't have to read through every single one of these. Just as an example, um, students had to understand the parts of the flower. And that was covered in a previous video. The reason they had to understand that is because they wouldn't be able to track the journey of the sperm cells during double fertilization if they didn't know what parts of the flower they were going through. Now, I decided that um, my students had had enough review with this particular topic, so I didn't review it in this video. However, I did review other things at the beginning of the video. Students need to understand pollen structure and the cells within the pollen grain in order to understand the content of this video and students need to understand ovule structure and the cells within the ovule in order to understand this video and get the associated assessments right. So both of these things were covered in previous videos, but there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of different types of cells and you have to know where they are relative to each other. So it's a little bit of complicated content. So I decided to review these two things at the beginning of this video because I, I decided it was really, really important for them to remember these things in order to understand the rest of the video and to be able to get the associated assessments right. So this is also a good place where you can decide whether something is worth reviewing at the beginning of your video or whether something is not worth reviewing. And just as in many aspects of teaching, getting good at figuring out what these pieces of, of prior knowledge that are needed are will just come with experience. So don't worry if you don't feel like you can provide an exhaustive list of all knowledge needed to understand everything in your video. That's not the point here. The point here is just to identify things that you might need to review. Okay, so that's pretty much it for planning your video. Filling these sections of this template out will save you a lot of time in the long run in video production because you're less likely to miss important aspects of your content when producing your video, so you won't have to go back and fix your video later. And remember, the most important part of filling out this template, or really, of course, design in general, is having really well-defined and carefully considered learning objectives. Everything else derives from those. If you're experienced in teaching this content, for example, maybe you've taught this course several times before that you want to make this video for, this entire process, filling out this template up until prior knowledge, will only take you probably about 10 to 20 minutes or so, assuming you already have all the questions written and you have a pretty good idea of what you want to teach and the activities that the students will do to complete your learning objectives. But even if you've taught this material before, it is worth putting some time into making sure that your assessments and other activities do adequately address each learning objective. Okay, so that's it for planning your video. Of course, this process is the one I use and you should feel free to modify it in any way you see fit or to completely build your own process of video planning. Okay, so hopefully by now you have a better idea of how to go about planning your first video. You'll also have to eventually lay out all the visuals that will appear in your video, but we'll get to that later. Before that, I wanna go over two things. In the next video, I'll talk about the equipment that I use to record a basic screencast. And in the video after that, I'll give you a detailed tutorial on the screencasting program, Explain Everything. See you then.